Okay, well, I want to begin by thanking you for inviting me to be part of this wonderful event. I have enormous love and respect for Canada and Canadians, and you have no idea how special this is for someone like me. Um, I'm a 53-year-old father of three and grandfather of two. I'm a musician, a writer, I'm a radio producer, and I'm a pilgrim. And I'm a podcaster as well. I host My Camino, the podcast released every Tuesday. And we're approaching half a million downloads. Now, I don't know about you, but this life <laughs> is a blur. And if I told you at Christmas to call me via Zoom, you would have said, what are you talking about? But here we are, a true new world order. And to be speaking to you from my little studio in Sydney to you in Canada is incredible. And I'll tell you about my connection with Canada later. But there's an old story. A couple of Canadians fly into Australia one December to catch some summer. And they go straight from the airport to the hotel bar. The locals are surprised to see them wearing heavy coats. The Australians are having a beer and one of them said, I wonder what's going on with those guys wearing coats over there? So he goes over and says, hey, where are you from? And the bloke says, hey, Hosa, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, hey. And the Australian nods and walks back to his group. His friend said, so where are they from? He said, I don't know. They don't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> so I started school. I started school as a little boy in a town called Toowoomba on the Darling Downs. Um, it's in Queensland. And you'll all understand Queensland. And I want to start with a short story. This one's true. I was six in the first two years of school when my teacher, who was a sports fanatic, told us about the Munich Olympic Games. And I was totally hooked. So I was six years old. And I had a scrapbook and it was the first games where they listed and stylized all of the sports as design icons. And all the sports were depicted in the same icons. I can still picture them today. I was totally in. And then of course, the horror. Remember the hooded gunman on the balcony of the Israeli team's room. So I was six and it scared the absolute daylights out of me. Four years later, I was 10 and the same teacher says, let's get excited about Montreal. And he sees that I'm freaking out, so frightened again. And he said to me, and I've never forgotten it. He says, you had nothing to worry about, Danny. This is Canada. Everything will be fine. Montreal and that crazy designed stadium and your design iconography was so much better than Germany's. But it was all so far removed from my life in Toowoomba in rural Queensland. I was playing cricket, serving as an altar boy, riding my push bike up and down the valleys of the Darling Downs, one of the 11 children. And I was, there were nine boys in my family, two, two girls. And there was a neurotic beagle named Pugsley. He was named after the boy in the Adams family. We used to watch Happy Days, the Brady Bunch, shows like that when we were kids. That was, of course, the United States, but it was still America. And even the Jetsons, the Flintstones, we, when we watched the Flintstones, we wondered, well, perhaps we're not the most dysfunctional family after all. <laughs> but family was very important to me and still is. My wife, Jennifer, and I live in Sydney's inner suburbs. We're just four kilometres from the Opera House. Our youngest son, Riley, is the only child at home. Well, his older brother, who has been at college, is back here now waiting for the virus to pass. My eldest son is a chef in Brisbane, a thousand miles away. Uh, Jen's a designer at the number one magazine in Australia, the Australian Women's Weekly. And I'm one of the producers of the top radio program in the country, the Alan Jones Breakfast Show on 2GB and stations right around Australia. And I present a weekly segment on Alan's program called The Bush Telegraph. I tell stories from rural areas to people in the city. Um, the stories, I'm, as I'm sure you'd be aware, living in such a broad, vast land like Canada, are incredible. I'll tell you a quick story. I was in the town of Tamora, which is 16 hours west of here. And I went out to report on a thoroughbred racehorse that was setting record times in trials. It was a two-year-old. The horse's name was Ezra Starr. And I met the trainer at the pub late in the afternoon and he invited me to join him early the following morning, well before sunrise. And no one really knows why racehorses train before daybreak, but there I was. And as my eyes focused, I could see the trainer in a small Corolla sedan driving around the track, pulling the horse's reins through the driver's side window. And I thought, huh, maybe I'll invest. And later that morning, I was having a beer at the bar at the hotel talking to the barmaid. And I said, you know, I might throw some money behind that horse. 
It's a nice looking horse, a sophisticated name, Ezra Star. She said, Dan, that's rat's ass backwards. <laughs> I decided not to invest. I could talk to you here all day about the people I met, their lives, their battles with droughts and floods and bushfires. Earlier this year, I was in the fire grounds in the wake of the summer infernos you'd have seen on television. It's actually one of the things we share with you. You have wildfires and we have bushfires and Canadian firefighters have come to Australia to fight our fires. and We've sent crews to you to help at your fire grounds. And can I tell you, it's heartwarming beyond words to see communities come together across the world to help one another, to support one another, to be a family of sorts. Family. John Lennon sang about a brotherhood and sisterhood of man. And I knew and know the value of brotherhood and sisterhood of all of us, of siblings, the value of support and nurturing, how important it is to be able to place your trust in another, to believe someone is there for you, someone who will listen, someone to reach out to, someone to be there, to care, to share. Music was a big part of our lives growing up. There were six boys in my bedroom, two sets of bunks and two single beds. My oldest brothers would turn, take turns to play an album each night as we drifted off to sleep. Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Cat Stevens, Van Morrison. And for almost as long as I can remember, there were guitars in the corner of the room, a banjo, a piano in the lounge room. It's who I am. And when I think about family, I sometimes visualize the strings of a guitar. Individually, the strings ring out an individual tune and true sustaining note. They create a presence of their own. But when they're played as part of a chord, well, it's an entirely different sound. The chord is a complex mix of harmony and tune. The sound of each string complements the others. The ringing notes side by side are greater than their individual parts. Even plucked individually, they sound out melody. But the chord is true togetherness, harmony, family. My brother Ben died in 2010, and I'll talk to you about his journey later. Another little brother, Leo, died in September last year from cancer. The three of us played music together. Indeed, we were music. And music is more and much more to me than just a part of me. It is my family. And I'm so delighted to be invited to speak to you today to talk about our place in the Camino family, the global family of pilgrims. My association with the Camino de Santiago began in 2008. My mother is a doctor of theology and kept a comprehensive library. I was staying with her and noticed a book on the shelf, Shirley MacLaine's book, The Camino. And I read it in a day. I still don't know if it makes sense, to be honest. And then in 2010, I was back at mum's after my youngest brother, Benny, had died. And I was searching for something. Answers, most probably. He died of a broken heart. He just slipped out of time with the rest of us. He's a supremely gifted musician and being out of time drove him insane and he never recovered. He was 42. To pass the time at mum's, I ran my fingers over the spines of her books and old titles winked at me. The Power of Now, I'm Okay, You're Okay, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, The Power of Positive Thinking. And then I saw The Camino and I read it again in a day. And I decided I'd walk the Camino one day in Benny's honor. But of course, time flies by as only time can. We have children to raise and a working life calling and music in the form of your latest favorite record comes and goes because time waits for no one. And then in 2016, I was scheduled to attend the Olympic games in Rio. It's ironic when you think about my early years and the impact those early events had on me. But the radio station I worked for in Sydney went through a particularly tumultuous time. Budgets were scrapped, people marched out the door, lives were ruined. I was lucky to keep my job, but I wasn't going to Rio. So the boss said, have three weeks off, spoil yourself. I said, what? There's no point in me taking time off when my children are at school. And my wife said to me over dinner that night, why don't you do that silly walk you've been talking about for years? I made every excuse I could think of, but three days later, the ticket to Spain was on the kitchen bench, a gift from my family. There's that word again, family. Six weeks later, I arrived in Santiago de Compostela 
on my 50th birthday. I walked half the Camino Frances from Sahun, and it changed me forever. And I'll explain why. Walking the Meseta, uh, my mind was driving me insane. It was not too good for me to have too much time to think. Not good at all. But I'll, I'll read from my journal at the time because I decided to challenge my, myself. If, if this was to be the cathartic journey of a lifetime, it needed to be cleansing. And the bells of St. Benedict's convent in Sahun rang out six times. I was finally on the Camino, preparing to head out on my first day on the ancient and spiritual trail. I chose St. Benedict's because my little brother was Benedict. And the bell tower sits atop the 12th century cathedral where the night before, the cloistered nuns had blessed us prior to sending us on our way. A few moments after walking out the door of the convent with a quiet prayer, I was on my own, walking alongside the road as the sun rose slowly in the distance. The lights of Sahun faded behind me, the sounds of the town eased and the gravel crunched beneath my feet. There's nothing like the first few steps, the first few minutes on the Camino. You've arrived. Many of my guests on my Camino, the podcast, suggest your Camino begins the day you decide you're going to walk. It's that moment you become a pilgrim. You're not only preparing yourself, walking more, buying equipment and doing your research, but you're also preparing your heart and soul for what's ahead. There'll be much soul searching, much time and space. And that message was forefront of my mind as the Meseta, the middle third of the Camino, broadened around me. Peering into the distance, you can almost make out the curvature of the earth, so wide and vast is the horizon you walk toward. Two days later, having walked through the dusty vagueness of Relagos, the silent beauty of Mansilla de las Mulas, before arriving in Leon, it dawned on me that I was thinking too much about nonsense, worrying about work, feeling guilty about leaving my family behind. I worried about money, which was ridiculous, and I worried about my future because as if I can do anything about my future. But in, in, in Leon, I stumbled upon restaurant Las Termas on Cal Paloma. The cafe looks directly across the town square under the facade of the 13th century cathedral with its spires towering over the pilgrims and tourists craning their necks to take it all in below. A narrow cobblestone alley leads to the 10th century Basilica di San Isidoro, home to the tombs of kings and queens past. The legendary Spanish designer Antony Gaudi designed the Casa Batines, a short walk from the cathedral in the center of the old city. Leon is alive with history and culture. Albergue de Peregrinos and Francisco de Assis welcomed me after an afternoon of wandering the ancient streets. But I wanted more from my pilgrimage. So I prayed to St. Francis of Assisi himself, who walked these very streets as he made his pilgrimage to Morocco in the early 13th century. I would find the answers. So the following day between Leon and St. Michael del Camino, I had an idea that I'd dedicate each day to five years of my life. I'd think of nothing but those five years, the mistakes I made, the people I hurt, people who hurt me, uh, my loves, my lovers, my family, where I worked and who I worked for, who I hurt and how I hurt them, who hurt me and what it meant to me. And I thought of nothing else and spoke to no one until I had finished with those five years. Then I said a small prayer, sang a song, honouring my wife and children, my parents and late brothers, and let it all go. All of it. And as the broad and golden sweep of Spain roared around me, I cried. I laughed. I was angry. I was sad, frustrated, embarrassed, humiliated, delighted, proud. But most of all, I was relieved. I was arriving in Santiago de Compostela, as I said, on my 50th birthday, and I wanted to arrive alive. I wanted to arrive free. The Meseta draws to a close in the days after Astoria. The plains make way for rolling hills, dense forest, sweeping views across the Galician landscape. And after 10 days, I was just outside Palas del Rey, reaching the end of my journey of the mind. I said my prayers my peace, sang my songs and waited. There were three fence posts wired together to my right, 
Then further up the path, two posts were wired as one. And then the same distance up the path, there was just one lone post. I counted with the posts perfectly placed to restart my life, just as I do every day as I restart a broadcast. Three, two, one. 50 years of me, 50 years of Dan Mullins floated away like I was pushing through a wave at the beach. I damp looked behind me. I was giddy, lighter, with the sun streaming through the trees in beams, and I had no doubt I had dealt with it all. No regrets, no enemies, no sadness, no sorrow, no anger. Well, it's easy to say, it's not so easy to do. Because what's the point of carrying it all around with you? So it's there on the Camino now, all of it among the emerging hills of the Galician Mountains, alongside the ancient and spiritual trail they call El Camino, a perfect place to leave my intentions, my prayers, my faults, failures, regrets. And you'd think I'd have welcomed the chance to leave it all behind, but no. I arrived in Santiago, celebrated my 50th birthday at the midday pilgrim's mass, holding my late father's prayer book in my hand. I felt a sense of closure, but that meant it was now time to open up. Back in Sydney, just a few weeks later, it dawned on me I had to go back. The Camino was calling me, ringing in my ears every day. My family said, go, you must go. So I walked from Lourdes to Santiago in 2017, a journey of a thousand kilometers, the journey of a lifetime. And I picked up some of those old stories and emotions when I went back, particularly the grief following the death of Ben. I wanted to sift through some of that baggage. I wanted to sort through some of the papers. I longed for the memories, Ben in particular. We played music together from the time we were boys. We discovered Elvis Costello together. <laughs> we sang harmonies and I loved him so much and still do. Benedict. I walked the Camino to find some of the closeness my grief provided. I cried like a three-year-old. I wanted to let go and let go I did. All of it. Let me tell you one of my favorite Camino stories, La Familia Growing, Walking Fields Afar. I walked alongside a Welsh pilgrim, Lee Robertson. We traveled together day after day, hour after hour, mile after mile, but he didn't talk much but I still waited to listen because I knew he'd open up at some stage. I could tell he wanted to share and was waiting for the right person to care. So I asked him one day, walking into Santo Domingo, why are you walking the Camino, brother? And I wrote later that day in the garden of the municipal albergue, and I'll read here from the muddied pages of my diary. Lawrence Titus Oates was a British explorer. He became stranded in a blizzard in Antarctica in 1912, riven with frostbite and gangrene. Oates and his two colleagues, Robert Scott and Henry Bowers, knew their days were numbered. Titus was the weakest of the three. He said, I'm just going outside. I may be some time. He walked out of the tent, the ultimate act of selflessness. Scott and Bowers' bodies were found later that year. Oates' body has never been found. And I was walking with Lee between Nahira and Santo Domingo de la Cazada. We'd walk together from time to time over the course of the week. A Camino family was forming. And I was particularly fond of Lee and his brother Gary. They were terrific blokes. Why are you walking the Camino, brother? Well, he said, that's a good question. Lee had been working at a very stressful job in the UK. He hated it. And he hated the grip it had on his life. He wanted out, but you can't just walk out on life. So he took a pen and wrote on a piece of paper and stuck it to his computer. It said, I'm just going outside. I may be some time. Mm. He never went back. Weeks later, here he was just a couple of weeks later, walking alongside me. He'd had enough and he was still troubled very much by what he'd done. It took enormous guts to do it. But the unraveling of one's life takes some doing and you consider all the raveling it took to get to where we are today. Lee was doing his best. His brother Gary was helping to carry some of the load. They are in the lyrics of my song, Somewhere Along the Way, the Camino song. Gary is the lion's heart, the heart of a lion ready to care and to share. Lee is the opening heart. His heart and soul emerged as each day passed. 
He was warming. His smile was warming. He was opening, giving, laughing, sharing. He was enjoying himself and life. And we talked that day side by side, telling our stories. I suppose he'd had a breakdown of sorts. His was not a life that he really wanted to live. So was it an act of self-sacrifice or gallantry even? Well, we not only walked and talked, but we also walked and thought. Just beyond the town of Siroina, we caught up to other pilgrims. Lee and I held back a bit as we walked as a group together, our conversation lingering. And just outside Siroina, we happened upon a ghost town. Not a ghost town like you'd imagine in a Hollywood Western. This was a brand new town built alongside a golf course, Rioja Alta Golf Club, but no one bothered to turn up. The swimming pool was empty, the units were all boarded up, the vast car parks were completely empty. There was no one. The golf course was pristine and the Camino went right up to the front of the clubhouse and a sign on the fence read Peregrinos Bienvenidos, Pilgrims Welcome. So we downed our backpacks and wandered inside. It was the clashing of two distinctly different worlds. Lush carpet, wall to ceiling windows, opening out onto manicured fairways and lush greens, and eight crusty, grimy, sweaty, pathetic pilgrims. And as we walked into the courtyard from the street, I thanked Lee for telling me his story. My pleasure, man, he said. I needed it. Five beers and three wines cost 11 euros. So we stayed a while. Lee and I raised a toast to new friends and new beginnings. And we welcomed him back into the tent. I told you earlier that I host a podcast about the Camino. If you're not familiar with podcasts, let me tell you to get familiar. If you love to grow roses, there are podcasts about roses. If you love baseball, there are a thousand podcasts about baseball. And I started the podcast when I returned from my Camino in 2017. I wanted to somehow remain connected to the ancient path. So each week I contact someone from somewhere around the world and talk to them about their Camino. It's the perfect therapy for a lonely, lonely pilgrim pining to get back to the way. I can ask them whatever I want. Sometimes it has nothing to do with their Camino, but it might have something to do with why they are pilgrims. And I spoke to Moni Dejeji from Canada. She and her husband met on the Camino, and they ended up walking all the way from St. jean pied de port to Jerusalem. Their lives continue to be about sharing their experiences, their love, their community, their family. And Moni wrote a book called Walking Alone, The Pilgrim's Guide to the Inner Journey. I asked her what she would whisper into the ear of her 12-year-old self. She said, everything's going to be okay. And I spoke with Jennifer Wills from Toowoomba, my hometown. Her parents died within weeks of each other and she was completely lost and disillusioned. Jennifer's family was everything to her. She was walking aimlessly through the streets of Brisbane and found herself walking upstairs to a bookshop she'd never seen before. Aimlessly wandered in there. She didn't even know why or what she was doing. She reached out and picked up a book. It was a guide to the Camino de Santiago. She'd never heard of it. She and her daughter had been through hell together. Jen's daughter was struggling with life and Jen had thrown her lifeline after lifeline, but it just seemed like her daughter was choosing to drown. So Jen took her daughter on the Camino. It wasn't easy. In fact, it was a disaster to begin with. Jen was sitting on her bunk in an albergue sobbing. This is a disaster. Why had she been so foolish? A man approached her and said, you know what I just heard in the town square? And Jennifer said, no. He said, your daughter is laughing. So Jen ran to the square and there was her daughter alive, telling stories, living, breathing. It was a miracle. When I spoke to Jen on my podcast, she said she couldn't, well, she shouldn't have dared to believe. But her dreams came true. And when I asked her to describe the Camino, she said, it's like you start in St. John with a ball of string in your stomach. You can feel it sitting there. You attach it to the archway in St. John, and it slowly unravels. By the time you reach Santiago, there's no ball of string. You're empty. The Camino provides. Jennifer sends me updates. She shares. She cares. Our family. Our Camino family. I interviewed Martin Jemison from Newfoundland. 
he found land. And we talked about him surviving a near-miss car accident on the Maseta. He said, not a day's go by when his consciousness is not sparked by a Camino thought of consideration. He's watching now, today. Roxy Edwards is a pilgrim from Vancouver Island in Canada. She decided to walk the Camino, but first she had to make some very difficult and challenging life decisions. Her husband has multiple sclerosis. She was leaving him behind in a wheelchair. Hers was a journey of letting go, of not fearing change, of being brave and walking to discover yourself and others. She gained so much from what she learned on the Camino. She spent last summer traveling from one side of Canada to the other, camping each night in a tent under the stars. And she took her husband with her. Roxy walked into a bar in Newfoundland, and I'm told you couldn't find two places further apart. I don't really know, but I'm probably talking out of hand here. They're in Vancouver Island and Newfoundland. But she was wearing her favorite Camino t-shirt. The barman said, hey, there's a guy who drinks here, lives down the road. He's done that walk. So Roxy left her card. The local who drank at the bar was Martin Jamison. They reached out, connected, and I interviewed Roxy a few weeks later. The Camino provides. And the family grows. Tony Jacques is from the Blue Mountains just outside of Sydney. He took part, not, took part last year in what's called I'll Push You, Accessible Camino. You'd be aware of Patrick Gray and Justin Shisak, who walked in 2016. Justin suffers from a rare neurological disease, and Patrick pushed him in a wheelchair the entire length of the Camino Frances. The film is called I'll Push You. Justin and Patrick. Justin told Patrick about his dream to one day travel the Camino. And Patrick replied, I'll push you. Last year, Patrick and Justin led a team of pilgrims who pushed, pulled, guided, and spirited a group of special needs pilgrims. And pilgrims volunteered from all over the world to help out. To give your time to enable someone less fortunate to, than you to share the joy of a Camino is the ultimate gift, a collective gathering of souls working together, a family. I walked in 2016 and found myself outside Astoria one fine morning. As I rounded a corner, I heard full-blown laughter, and I stumbled on three Canadian pilgrims, Keith, Miles, and Doug. Keith had cancer. Doug had just beaten cancer, and Miles was buying the drinks. Theirs was a collective Camino, and they were having the time of their lives. We walked together for a few days, sharing stories. And Australians and Canadians share a fellowship. There's something in our collective DNA. But I lost them the day before we arrived in Santiago, and I didn't find them before I flew home. But I was desperate, desperate to find them, to reach out. I simply posted on Facebook, Hi, I've just finished the Camino de Santiago with three Canadian pilgrims, Doug, Keith, and Miles. I found them in 36 hours. We stay in touch regularly, my Camino family, and I can't wait to one day pick up where we left off. I've interviewed couples who have found love again, couples who met on the Camino and now have children. I've interviewed pilgrims who dared to wish, dared to dream. They came home with such a glow, their friends and family stood around them, warming themselves. This is family. I mentioned earlier my little brother Leo, who died in late September last year. He was a beautiful human being, and I was with him the night he died. He told me not to worry. And I thought it was the greatest blessing a brother could bestow on another. Don't worry. I'm doing my best to honour his wishes, but it's a difficult course to navigate. Being here, talking about the Camino, being present, trying, caring, sharing, all of this is putting wind in my sails. And you're Canadians, and I'm Australian. And as Tom Friesen said to me in Lake Tahoe in March, we're the Commonwealth contingent. Indeed we are. Imagine St. James was listening to us right now. Imagine we asked him what he hoped we gained from walking in his footsteps. If the first person who had the courage to put their hands up to answer St. James said, family, he'd be delighted. Family. Family makes you cry, makes you proud, makes you want so much more, makes you wish time would stand still, makes you wish you could rewind and relive, makes you wonder where the time went, 
Camino family makes you think back to when you helped someone treat a blister or shared a meal or were offered a meal. Someone you didn't know gave you a hug when you were exhausted. You sang at the top of your lungs when you hadn't sung in years. When you prayed again after 25 years. When you walked into a church, it was hot outside, cool and dark inside. Would you be welcome? But you just paused. Perhaps you prayed again and hoped again. The Father, Son and Holy Spirit, the family of your family. But maybe they're not the family of your future. Here you are in a majestic ancient cathedral looking at all the splendor and riches of the church. Is this what Jesus would have wanted? The son of a carpenter from Jerusalem. His fishermen friends. James, son of Zebedee, in whose steps we walk. Well, one of the great things about the Camino is you're rarely asked, what do you do? Who cares if you're a banker, a doctor, a car park attendant, a busker? No one cares. You're you. We're all walking, after all, in the footsteps of a humble fisherman. And we ought to remember we are here talking on the internet in 2020, a million miles from the front room in Toowoomba, where a little boy once on a cr had a crush on Jan Brady. The world is ours. Family is about identifying with brothers and sisters alongside us, and those who walk in step or maybe walk past us, who offer us Buen Camino. Tom Gulak left Canada on January the 25th, 1997. He arrived in Sydney on Australia Day, January 26. I picked Tom up from the airport. It was 34 degrees at Sydney. He climbed into the car. He was all red-faced and flustered. It wasn't just jet lag, jet lag. He said, whoa, it's hot. And I said, yeah, it's probably early 30s, I'd say. It's pretty, yeah, pretty hot. He said, when I left Roblin, Manitoba yesterday, Dan, it was minus 40. So no wonder he was flustered. He'd had a 74 degree turnaround in two days. My then flatmate had gone to Canada on a teacher exchange program. Tom lived with us for a year and we loved him. It still do. We lived a hundred meters from Bondi beach in Sydney. The day he arrived and remembering he'd never seen the ocean. I said to him, don't go into the water unless I'm with you. Just don't do it. He said, okay, I'll stand on the sand and watch. Four hours later, he arrived home all red faced, excited, exhilarated, exhausted. I said, well, what'd you make of it? He said, it is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. He went to the beach every single day he was in Australia. He became part of the beach culture, made friends with locals, played and hosted volleyball tournaments on the sand. And I used to host table tennis tournaments in my garage. And we would stand around drinking large bottles of beer out of the bottle. So almost a litre full of beer in a big tall bottle and we would drink out of the bottle. It was kind of a joke. We treated it like a joke. We shouldn't really have been doing it. But Tom went to a function with the other exchange teachers, a formal occasion at a venue by the harbour. It was Bring Your Own, BYO. The event hosted by Australians who had returned from overseas the year before. Tom was standing with a large bottle of beer in his hand and one of the Australian hosts pointed out, one wouldn't normally be drinking straight out of the bottle, Tom. Jen was horrified when Tom came home to tell us. He figured, well, when in Rome, but as Jen said, Dan, you fed him to the lions. The Camino has given me an opportunity to grow. I can't describe it. But I'm very much like my mother. When you call someone and the voice on the other end of the line says, press one for, press two for, I want to scream. For goodness sake, just pick up the phone and speak to me. And I'm hopeless when it comes to technology, just like my mother. Give me a slow stew and I'll caress it with love. When my phone says, update available, I want to throw it into Sydney Harbour. We're just like that, mum and I. Mum had 11 children. Thomas, the youngest, died the day he was born had some sort of chest problem and dad buried him before mum left the hospital. It still hurts her today. Some wounds never heal, no matter how hard we try. Mum had nine children in 12 years. She said to me last year, I wish I'd worried less about making sure you were fed and clothed and more about loving you. But I felt for her, what, what more could she do? All those children, 
Those mouths to feed, shoes to shine, socks to mend, bones to heal, hair to tussle, faces to kiss. Think about it. 12 years, three meals a day, 11 people, more than 12,000 meals a year, every year, year after year. Over 20 years, mum prepared about a quarter of a million meals. Then in 1970, mum had twins. With seven children already under her feet, she gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl. Now there are nine mouths to feed, the youngest two both on her hip, simultaneously. We had no help. Dad helped as best he could, but it was pretty much mum on her own. And then we adopted another baby. There was a little baby at one of the local hospitals. His mother was a teenager and had been unable to care for the boy. Someone told mum the child just lay there all day, every day, never made a sound, never cried. Mum and dad thought, well, what's one more mouth to feed? Well, the truth is it's about 1,100 meals a year. And they signed the papers. And Nicholas John Mullins arrived a few days later. He never stopped crying from the moment he arrived. <laughs> Day and night, week after week, he cried. But he grew into a fine man, a brother like my others. And Nick was a young boy at the beach a few years later. And he was going brown, like really brown. And mum and dad did some research and discovered he is Indigenous Australian. He's now fiercely proud of his heritage, his culture, his people, as are his children, as are we. And he and mum are part of a trivia team meeting each week to compete in a club competition. They win from time to time too. Mum rings us or emails us to tell us she's proud and ought to be. All those children, their spouses, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and not one single person is estranged from another. We all get along well. We're all delighted with one another's company. We love to listen and to tell stories, to make one another laugh. We love to sing and we miss dad. I tell mum, we oughtn't worry about loving us more. She oughtn't worry about loving us more. She did an incredible job. Her love and legacy will live on for generations. She's the life and soul of all of us. Press two to stop crying. I've interviewed more than 170 people for my podcasts, and I've been asking my guests lately one word they'd use to sum up the Camino. I say laughter because I think it's wonderful to walk past a group of pilgrims and hear laughter. Me and my Camino family laughed often and laughed hard, and it was a delight to make one another laugh. Indeed, we were shushed a few times in albergues because we were laughing after lights out. But it's wonderful to laugh. Other pilgrims have said peace, freedom, transformative, grounded, trust, community, love, creativity, connection, life, humble, inspired, and liberated. Patty Pye from San Francisco said sensual. She said her senses were alive on the Camino. Indeed, you listen to the bird song, the cow bells, the town and church bells, the crunching of the gravel beneath your feet. I don't listen to music when I walk because I want to be enveloped in the sound of my surroundings. And plenty of pilgrims want or need music in their heads to motivate them, to keep moving. I'm a little different. I love the sound of France and Spain. I say France because when I read Bill Bennett's book, The Way, My Way, he spoke about the cuckoo birds in the trees as you leave St. jean Peter port And I was walking up the hill on the very outskirts of town when I heard them. I was so happy. We have cuckoos in Australia, but they're pretty rare. But the birds just inside the French border sounded like something off a movie. It was magic. And I was pleased I had the opportunity to hear them. The other joy of walking and listening is the joy of conversation. As I said earlier, I would often ask people I walked with or beside, and there is a distinction there, I would ask them, why are you walking the Camino? Often they didn't know, or they were walking to find out. Others wanted a holiday, others reflection. Some walk for redemption, for forgiveness, or for the opportunity to discover a bit more about themselves because it is a chance for discovery. Whether you like it or not, believe you can, you're halfway there. Katie Trulson in episode 43 talks about just being. And I saw a sign in a shop recently, a quote attributed to Buddha. The secret of health for mind and body is not to mourn for the past, worry about the future or anticipate troubles, but to live in the present moment wisely and earnestly. 
Pilgrims talk about meeting someone in a small village and that person changing their lives. They talk about what it means to open your heart, your soul. So what exactly does that mean? Take this online gathering with you. Take it in your heart. Give it to your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your lover, yourself. Give patience, give understanding, give time, give love, give you. Your family will thank you forever. The Camino family will thank you forever. And if I'm someone in this Camino family, maybe I'm Gilligan, the crew member on a three-hour cruise only to end up shipwrecked. Maybe I'm Jan Brady, a middle child, forever looking up and down and diagonally to see my siblings, however they came into my lunch. I'm me. I'm the sum of my parts. I'm the notes in that chord. I'm not just someone sliding their hands across the strings. I'm a chord perfectly placed, fingers perfectly placed. Each note a ballast for the melody of the future. And you, like me, are pilgrims. We share and care for this life together as family. Let me tell you a story. The renowned bohemian novelist and short story writer Franz Kafka lived from 1883 to 1924. He never married, he had no children. One day he was strolling through Steglitz Park in Berlin and he chanced upon a young girl crying her eyes out because she had lost her favorite doll. She and Kafka looked for the doll but couldn't find her. Kafka told the little girl, meet me there the next day and we'll look again. When they met the following day, they searched again, but still there was no sign of the doll. Kafka reached into his pocket gave the little girl a letter written by the doll. It said, please do not cry. I've gone on a trip to see the world and I'm going to write to you about my adventures. Thus began a story that continued to the end of Kafka's life. When they would meet, Kafka would read his carefully composed letters of adventures and conversations about the beloved doll, which the girl found enchanting. Mm -hmm. Finally, Kafka read her a letter of the story that brought the doll back to Berlin and he gave her the doll that he had purchased. The girl said, this doesn't look at all like my doll. Kafka handed her another letter that said simply, my trips, they have changed me. The little girl hugged the new doll and took it home with her. Just a year later, Kafka died. Many years later, the now grown up girl found a letter tucked into an unnoticed crevice in the doll. The tiny letter signed by Kafka said, everything you love is very likely to be lost, but in the end, love will return in a different way. There are so many songs to sing, so many melodies to discover. Embrace the future, enjoy your place in the global Camino family. Reach out, share and care, get lost, be found. Like a small doll, my trips, they have changed me. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your celebration of spirit. And I hope you find what you're looking for somewhere along the way. Buen Camino. Somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way.